All right, hello folks. I wanna start with a quick, uh, a quick poll, right? So we'll use our, our hands to vote here, right? So who here is a fan of sports? Okay, well, what about, what about the, the arts? Okay, okay. Who here is a fan of science? Yeah, okay. So I have come from afar to bring a bag of science. I'm a developer uh, advocate with Google Cloud, and I am here representing a research project within Google Cloud that we call Dora. Who's heard of Dora? Yeah, cool. Hi, everyone. So uh, DORA stands for DevOps Research and Assessment, and it's a research group within Google Cloud. We've been going since about 2014. Uh, and over those years, we've do a, a, a rigorous scientific analysis of DevOps practices, DevOps teams. We approach it from the team level. And we use the information we gather to understand what kinds of practices teams do and what outcomes they get from it. And then we share that with the community. So uh, here's how we get our data. We, we take a, uh, methods from the behavioral science practices and we do a broad survey across thousands of engineers uh, uh, around the world. Anyone here participated in our survey? Okay, sweet. So thank you. You are part of the data we are showing today. Um, we ask a whole bunch of questions and then we apply analytical statistical models to make a, a, a rigorous uh, body of data. Um, and uh, as a result, we developed this model. So the, some of the things I'm gonna tell you are similar to what we started out this conference with. Uh, we heard from Jeremy uh, yesterday morning about four metrics that are really important for software delivery and how we can use them to inform the way we do software delivery. I'm uh, coming at it from a slightly different angle here. We use uh, survey-based data collection methods. He was talking about instrumentation. I think there's a lot to learn from both. And so I'm really excited to, to look at what we've learned and compare it to things that we've heard already. So again, we started in 2014 and we've developed this predictive model. This is a subset of our model. You can find the whole thing on our website, but we are not gonna get into every one of these little arrows, uh, rest assured that is all based on uh, a, a real like a, a rigorous analysis that's done by our data scientists. Uh, you can find a lot of information in our annual State of DevOps reports. Download them at bit.ly slash Dora dash Sodor, S-O-D-R. Okay, so the root of what we do is this predictive analysis. Predictive analysis is something that is about relationships between two things. It's not causation, because we, we're not gonna go so far as to say, if you do a certain thing, you are going to be successful. I'm not going to say, if you use Google Cloud, you're guaranteed to be the world's best software developer. I will say it's a great cloud, and that's the end of my pitch for Google Cloud. It's also, though, importantly, much stronger than correlation. Our predictive analysis says, when certain things happen, it's more likely that other things come out of it. What in particular? Well, one of the things that we've learned is there are four metrics that are strongly predictive of software delivery outcomes. Uh, and those four metrics there are two for speed, two for stability. Speed, how often are we deploying software to our end users? What is our lead time? How long from commit to when it's actually visible and users can use it? And these are balanced against stability metrics. One is how often do we deploy something and we say, oh, fiddlesticks, or perhaps even some saltier language. That's our change fail rate. And then when that does happen, and yes, let's all admit it does happen. That's actually can be a good thing that it happens. How fast can we repair? And that's our time to restore service. Now, there's also an additional metric here, which is which called reliability. We actually used to call this availability. Um, this year, we renamed it to reliability to reflect the fact that it's more than just uptime. And so these four keys plus the one are all together taken as something that we call the software delivery and operations construct. And it fits into our model as both an outcome of practices and a predictor of other outcomes. So adding it all up, here's the model all together. So we start from the right. What are we trying to achieve? We're trying to achieve commercial outcomes, right? These are things like market share, things like profitability, things like employee retention, the stuff that everyone all the way up to the CIO and the CEO and the board, they all care about this kind of stuff, right? To get that, that's predicted by software delivery and operations performance, which is measured by velocity, stability, and reliability. Now, how do we get that? That is where we have our catalog of capabilities. There are technical, 
process and cultural. These are the kinds of practices that are predictive of that software delivery success. Within that, we look at how teams are performing according to those four metrics, according to some of the outcome metrics, and we can ask ourselves, how do we fit? Um, what we find is that when we do a cluster analysis on our respondents, they boil down to four clusters. We found this uh, over the past several years that there have been four. It used to be three, now there's four. Um, but it's, the data speaks to us and tells us how many clusters there are. Low, medium, high, and elite. And so what you'll see is that there can be a pretty big spread there. The elites are deploying a lot. Low, not so much. Remember that uh, better numbers on these metrics are predictive of better outcomes. Important to recognize here is that if you used to be elite, you might not be anymore because the industry continues to accelerate. What you see is that the high performing groups are growing relative to the others. Also, the values of those high performing groups are growing year over year. So an elite today is faster than an elite was three years ago. So keep improving. Now, when we look at elite versus low, we see they're not just a little faster, they're way faster, right? The speed numbers are 6,570 times higher. And yes, it's the same on both because of the way the uh, survey methodology works, but uh, elite teams are deploying 6,500 times more often than low performers. Elite teams are recovering from incidents 6,500 times faster. And they're doing more frequent code deployments, 20, uh, almost 1,000 times. At the same time, those deployments that they're making are less likely to fail, one third as likely to fail. So these teams are moving fast and deploying higher quality software. How? How do they do that? How can we all become elite? How can we improve? And if we are elite, how can we stay elite by continuing to grow? Well, one of the things that uh, we've looked at is various capabilities. I'm not gonna get into all of them today. Uh, you can find uh, them all by going to this website. But uh, we have a catalog of capabilities and each year we do a deep dive into a few different parts of the research and, and some of the capabilities. So one of the ones that we look at, of course, is cloud. Uh, we found this year that an increasing number of customers or organizations are using multiple clouds. And this one I, I found interesting, that the biggest reason for using multiple cloud providers is to leverage the unique benefits of each provider. So every cloud has something to offer. And uh, we, of course, would love to talk to you about the things that Google Cloud has to offer. But um, teams are finding more and more, organizations are finding more and more uses of these services that are unique to each cloud and kind of mashing them up and making them great for them. Of course, there's also uh, reasons that people use cloud for greater availability, possibly disaster recovery. Uh, we think that there's a real maturity that's happened that uh, companies have figured out what the cloud is good for them for and are taking advantage of it. Important to recognize that just because you have a cloud doesn't mean you're getting all the benefits of the cloud. So there's an organization called NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology. That's a, a US organization. Um, and it's a, 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 an institution that um, just kind of establishes things like uh, protocols and, and definitions and stuff, right? So they have a definition of cloud computing. And their definition isn't that your service provider has the word cloud on it. Their definition is that it meets these five characteristics. These are what makes a cloud a cloud. And they're on-demand self-service, right? Can you just go and grab some resources? Broad network access, can you use your cloud from everywhere? Resource pooling, right, bin, bin packing effectively. My favorite, elasticity, can you scale up and scale down rapidly? And then measured service, how do you pay for it? Do you pay one big bucket or do you pay as you go? These are all things that you can get from the cloud. They're all things that you won't necessarily get from the cloud unless you make sure that you're getting them. And you can get them from any cloud. You can get them from an on-prem private cloud if that's where you want to uh, get them from. What we find is that the more of these characteristics that a team has, the better the impact of their cloud usage has, the more that their cloud usage is predictive of software delivery success. And as you see from the numbers here, these have all increased over the years and are continuing to grow. So people are not just using more cloud, they're getting more cloud out of their cloud. Documentation. We did a deep dive into documentation this year. This was the first time we've really looked at this. Now, we all know that we should do documentation, right? And then we all say, but do I have to? Why? What's in it for me, <laughs> right? What's in it for my customers? It can feel like a, a tax. It can feel like a drag sometimes. Um, but what we've learned is that documentation is important predictor of other technical excellence. Uh, teams that document 
uh, then this is about internal documentation, right? Developer documentation. Teams that, that have high quality documentation are much more likely to have best practices for security, best practices for reliability, to reach the reliability targets and to get those benefits from the cloud. So documentation isn't only about passing your knowledge along to other people, which is really, you know, kind of a nice thing to do, right? It also is gonna benefit the organization, help you get a raise. So do the documentation, it's a good use of your time. Managers, incentivize people for doing that documentation. It's a good use of the salary you're paying them. Now, we also looked at SRE. Uh, you heard uh, from Mel earlier today a great definition of what SRE is. In a nutshell, it's an approach to operations, one that was developed at Google starting uh, over 15 years ago. Um, SRE uh, originated independently of DevOps, right? It, happened, it started up kind of inside Google, and at the same time as the communities like this one were really refining what is DevOps. And from the beginning, people looked at these and said, mm, I see some similarity there. Are those the same? Are they different? Does SRE fit within a DevOps concept? So we, what we did this year is we wanted to ask, are people doing SRE? And then we wanted to find out, is it effective for them, right? So the first thing that we did is we took SRE, which has its own language, right? Um, some kind of uh, particular uh, ways of talking about things. And we de-jargoned it all. And we asked people about their reliability engineering practices. Um, and what we found is that the majority of teams we, we studied are doing some kind of SRE. Um, it's not limited only to Google or Facebook or some of the big companies you might read about in the SRE workbook. Uh, it's really pretty widespread. It also, it works, right? We found that teams that do uh, these SRE practices are almost two times more likely to meet or exceed their organizational goals. Now, the, intuitively, we all know this, right? If the site is available, you're more likely to make money from it. But the science backs it up. Similarly with security. Uh, we did a deeper dive this year into security and found that teams that integrate security best practices like shifting left are 1.6 times more likely to meet or exceed their organizational goals. This phrase has been used a lot already in this conference, shifting left. Uh, just to clarify what it means is that in the SDLC, as you move your code from left to right, from your workstation to deployment, shifting left means you're incorporating security into the work you're doing on the left side. So before you ship your code, before you commit it, you've got maybe a linter, you've got a static analysis, things like that. And maybe in your testing, you have some dynamic analysis. You don't just wait till the end to find out if it's sort of secure or not. When you do this, you can kind of naturally, intuitively understand that you're gonna get better security posture. But what we found is you also get better outcomes from an organizational perspective. So it's not only better for your, uh, your users and your security posture, it's also better for the bottom line. Security, shifting left. A similar model applies to reliability of shifting that left. All right, culture. Now, we found that teams uh, that are high performing and elite performing were much more likely to have a great generative culture or what you might call a Westrom generative culture. What's a Westrom generative culture? That sounds particular, right? It's very specific and it's something that is, uh, I think really can apply to almost any kind of work. Uh, I, I, I often talk about it with people who work outside of tech and they say, yeah, that, that is what makes us successful too. Uh, a Westrom culture, it comes from a sociologist named Ron Westrom and we use this model in our research. Ron Westrom was studying uh, back in the 90s Ron Westerman and his team of sociologists were studying people in high information contexts and, and places where uh, failure could be kind of serious, places like nuclear power plants, places like air traffic control, places like operating rooms, right? And they looked at how people in those contexts communicate with each other. And what they found is that they could divide the cultures into three types, the pathological type, <laughs> the bureaucratic type, and the generative type. You can probably guess which one we kind of like the best, but it has to do with how information is shared, right? In a pathological organization, if you bring me some information that I wasn't expecting, I'm gonna quote, kill the messenger, right? I'm angry, this, this doesn't work for me, I'm gonna stifle it, or I'm gonna try to make sure that I don't lose any of my headcount as a result of this new information, right? Uh, whereas in a generative culture, new information says, we say, well, that's interesting, let's go learn about it, let's go figure it out, right? Now, as 
science enthusiasts, we of course enjoy doing that more. Uh, but we also find that it's strongly predictive of organizational performance. So teams that were better at incorporating that discovery information, those generative teams, had better outcomes in the operating room, better outcomes at the nuclear power plant, and better outcomes in the um, software development process. The last deep dive that we did in the last year was around COVID-19, right? Um, and we looked at what's happened as a result of this pandemic. What we found, and this is my favorite finding from what we've done, is we found that teams with a generative culture, that Westroom generative culture of trust, information sharing, collaborative discovery, those teams were half as likely to experience burnout during the pandemic. Half as likely. Teams that had that culture could survive the pandemic, could keep their team co uh, cohesion and keep their productivity during the, the pandemic. Now, we are right now, we're sort of emerging as a, a, a planet from this pandemic, right? But something else is gonna happen. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's gonna be another pandemic. I don't know if it's gonna be some other crisis. Something's gonna happen and this culture becomes kind of a buffer, kind of an insurance against those catastrophes, breaking up our team and, and messing with our productivity. So investing in developing that culture, right? Practicing trust, practicing blamelessness, modeling good uh, exchange of information, all of that can help us get through that next crisis or, or perhaps that next opportunity, right? Maybe it's that uh, a customer comes to us and wants us to scale up 10 times what we had. Well, if we have a great culture, we're all gonna work together and we're gonna figure that out together. All right, what's next? Well, earlier this year, we uh, sent out our, our 2022 survey. Thank you to those of you who participated and collected a bunch of data. Some things the same, some things different. And we've been crunching those numbers and the report is coming out next week. I can't yet reveal a whole lot of the data, but I can tell you this. We did deeper dives into culture deeper dives into uh, reliability, and especially into security, right? Supply chain security is such an important topic these days. We've incorporated it deep into our model, and we've looked at uh, more inputs and more outputs from security practice. Now, this is science. Science means we ask questions and we let the data tell us the answers. Things change. So I'm going to be a, a terrible tease, and I'm going to tell you that there are surprises. So anyone who's read the reports for the past several years, there's interesting things this year. Um, and I, so I strongly encourage you to check it out. A lot of the core of what we do is unchanged, right? These kind of consistent truths, but some of the details have changed around in interesting ways. And this year you will find, in, in fact, we had, uh, we've, we're, we're going to have a whole section called surprises, things that, that the data is teaching us that we hadn't heard before. Uh, it's going to be released next week. And if you'd like to find it, visit this website, g.co slash DevOps, or you can scan this QR code. Or if you come up after this talk, I will scan your badge and we will send you a link to download the report as soon as it comes out. You won't regret it. Trust me, the surprises are good. Or, and also the, the stuff that's not surprises is good too. Uh, okay, final thoughts. I wanna close with some wisdom here. It's not my wisdom, I don't have any. It's uh, wisdom that we've learned from the, the, the science. So look, change is hard, right? This stuff we're talking about, this generative culture, making everything faster, incorporating security all the way through our pipeline. Some of this stuff is a lot different from what we've been doing. And we all know that change is hard. But here's the good news. You don't have to do it all at once. And in fact, you're probably gonna fail if you try to do it all at once. So we have learned through our research that the organizations that succeed in making this kind of cultural change, in really achieving DevOps culture or generative culture and uh, auto fast automated uh, code delivery, they're not succeeding by doing a, a boil the ocean approach, right? That tends to not work. Instead, what works is one at a time, grassroots, find one team, work with them, share that information. That's what's gonna create a lasting change in your organization. In my work, I work a lot with, uh, with customers who are trying to work through these kinds of changes. And sometimes I'll show up at a customer meeting and they'll say, yeah, we tried the DevOps, it didn't work here. And I say, okay, okay, tell me, how did you go about that change? And without exception, they say, well, 
some guy came in and told us we're all going to do DevOps. And so we spent a few months, you know, with a CI system and then we turned it off because we got bored. So look, that doesn't work. And uh, again, we know intuitively boiling the ocean doesn't work. The science backs it up. You, you can boil the ocean, but you got to do it one bucket at a time. Uh, again, your new favorite website, g.co slash DevOps. You will find uh, this year's report, by which I mean 2021, and next year's report, by which I mean 2022, coming next week. You will also find previous uh, State of DevOps reports where we do different deep dives every year. So I recommend checking out the, the previous reports. You'll learn things. Um, there's a quick check tool. So if you want to check your performance on those four key metrics, it takes about three minutes, and you can find out where you land, and you can filter that based on industry um, to see where you are relative to your peers. Um, you'll also find my favorite part of that website is the capability catalog. So we talked a little about capabilities like cloud uh, computing, like continuous integration, like automated testing. We also, there are things like the use of uh, observability and uh, then the leadership stuff about having blameless retrospectives, trust, autonomy, loose coupling. All of these things are capabilities that you will find listed here on this website. And for each one, we're going to tell you what it is, how to measure it, and how to improve it. So it's a great, great resource. With that, I will say thank you and uh, would love to scan your badge so I can send you a link to that report, which is going to be so good. Thank you. <laughs>